Are you finding it a challenge to find cash flowing rental property deals right now? Even if a great deal dropped into your the palm of your hands tomorrow, you may worry about how are you going to finance it? Should you take on more debt than you thought you would have to with the given interest rate environment? In today's video, I'm going to share a conversation I had with one of my trusted lending partners who works primarily with real estate investors. So we're going to talk about how you match your investment strategy in real estate with your financing strategy to have better results. So let's get started. I'm Veronica Woods. For those of you who are new to the Real Estate Wisdom channel, this is where we share tips about the market in the Philadelphia area, including suburban Delaware County, as well as best practices about building a more profitable rental property portfolio. Now I have a bunch of links below the video if you're watching on YouTube. If you wanna reach out and chat with me about maybe how I can help you or your team grow your real estate portfolio, if you wanna just schedule an appointment with one of the links below. So Owen, thank you for talking to my channel, my real estate wisdom followers on YouTube. I know you wear a lot of different hats. You're a lender, you're an investor, you're a developer, your real estate licensee, I think, as well. Um, so why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and more importantly, why your firm is so good with investors? Yeah, so thank you, Veronica, for having me here on your platform. Uh, my name is Owen Dublin. I'm out of the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area, and the name of my company is Bird Cash. My background, yes, I do loans for investors through Bird Cash. I'm the chief loan strategist. I'm also a real estate investor and developer. I do also have other real estate credentials that I do not utilize, um, <laughs> but I do have that knowledge. So when I have investor clients, I understand the full scope of the real estate process and different aspects that can impact their investment decisions. And the reason why I believe that my company is a great work with investors, one, because we are investing developers ourselves. And so we've been doing investing and developing you know, for about 20 years. So we understand the process of the fear of the new process of becoming an investor. But also as you are transitioning to new parts of investing, we understand, you know, that, that as well. So when I work with a client, it's not about just the loan product. It's about, you know, the strategy for their goal that they're trying to achieve. And they can get those insights with work with me as they go through their journey in investing in real estate. Yeah. I mean, I know when you, know, you talk to you for a few minutes, you definitely can tell the difference. So I was really excited to um, have you talk to my followers who are mostly professionals who are, are wanting to invest in real estate to kind of build a retirement portfolio or to kind of have their nine to five be more optional. So those are generally the people who are probably listening to us today. We keep that in mind. Okay. And, you know, one of the things that people ask me about is how am I going to get the financing? You know, I'm scared about getting the financing. So having you as a seasoned um, investor and lender talk to my audience is great. So I thought, I know we've had a lot of talks about strategy and what's going on in the market in, in Philadelphia now, but just kind of want to talk about some of what I hear is common challenges and concerns of probably some of both of our clients. And the first question, in considering your company is called Bird Cash, and that's with buy, rehab, refinance, rent, and repeat. Some may argue with the interest rates right now. Is Burr like on the coma? I won't say it's dead, but you know, is it kind of like asleep right now? Or what, 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 what would you say to that kind of statement? Is is Burr in the coma as a strategy? <laughs> Well, I don't think it's in a coma. I think that uh, if the, the individual realizes they're a real estate investor first, right? And what does that mean? A real estate investor, if they don't have it yet, they should have the criteria, right? Like, you know, what's the return that they're trying to make, for example, on that bird, right? Um, and also, too, are they open to exploring new markets? Because just because, for example, hmm. that strategy doesn't work in your current market, it doesn't mean it doesn't work in the market maybe 30 minutes away from you, right? So... As a real estate investor, you have to say, you know, how do I become better? 
because people are still investing in real estate every day. So, you know, if your market doesn't work, what do I need to do to become better? Or what what is my competitive advantage as an investor? Is it that in my local market, I network with, say, property managers or real estate professionals that are that have relationship with current investors who are, who are trying to, say, potentially retire, right? So people are still selling real estate every day in your current market and other markets. Uh, when it comes to looking at the interest rates, it goes back to you know running your numbers. Do, do your numbers work in the current environment? And in, when it, with this, you know, people feel like the rates are higher because we came from a pandemic interest rates. But reality, real estate investors are still investing now with the current rates as long as their numbers are achieving their their returns that they want. And it also as far as uh, real estate theory, right? You know, when rates are higher, you know, most people are sitting on the sidelines. Mm-hmm. As a real estate investor, you have to remember one of the things you want is one one negotiation. So use this as your advantage to say, okay, with the rates higher, I may potentially have less competition when I submit an offer. And if you can get that one one negotiation at the higher rates, you may get the price that you need to make the numbers work. And then when the rates go down in the future, you can refinance that asset and improve your cash flow. Okay, now you covered a lot in that. Uh, so this taking a step back, um, I think one of the things that that um, scares people about the interest rate environment and doing, let's say, a, a tactic that people d- did well in 2021 is that um, they're expecting this home, the home run of 2021 to be the success story of 2024. Um, and so I guess you can speak to, you know, Burr is just one way to kind of, you know, finance and, or a scale to be able to take your money out of one investment, have it go right into the next investment and go from there. And I think sometimes people are unrealistic about how much money they can take out and to invest in that next next investment. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I just kind of wanted to get a sense of like you could be successful. Success may look different at the various um, rate environments as they evolve. Yes, you're right about that. And I think this goes back to the, to the numbers, right? You know, when the investors run their numbers, I'd rather be for the Burr strategy, fix and flip, even, uh, you know, they have to say, OK, work with the real estate professional and get the, the comps, right? And how are we analyzing those comps accordingly? And then what do we know about the potential future environment of real estate, right? We can't predict the future, but we do have data points available at the present time. So for example, when they ask you to, for like the comps for potential fix and flip or the burst strategy, if you look at the, there's typically trends, right? So you may have say eight properties sold in the past six months. Are the prices increasing or are the prices decreasing from what currently has sold? What is the forward guidance from, say, the Federal Reserve when it comes to interest rates? Because if, you know, if the, if, you know, look at those data points and if the Federal Reserve says that they expect a rate cut in the future, that's positive news for investors versus they say they're going to plan to increase the rates. So I would say look at the current environment and get the data points. Also, talk to you, we talk to your contractors or material prices increasing or decreasing. So all of that matters. So then you can try to run more accurate numbers before you make the decision to purchase a, a property or not. So, I mean, I guess what, what you're saying, there's a, a big theme through it is like you got to run the number. So it's not anything car. You can't say anything in generality without running deal specific numbers, which as we talked about, people are either afraid of or feel like they can't do it. But my listeners, you know, I definitely have some content about running the numbers. But what about well, you mentioned about you know having a reasonable cash flow? So one of the numbers people people will run is you know how much cash flow would you get on a month month basis? So you know if somebody asks you what is good cash flow, like if you can put your lender hat on. Then your investor had on. How do you think about what um, cash flow is good enough? So I'm gonna take off my lender hat and put on just my <laughs> investor hat, and I'm gonna say depends where you are in your journey. Mm. And, and I say it like that because different type of real estate investing has different levels of risk. 
So if you're a brand new investor, you may take less risk for your first venture. And then in return, you may get a, a smaller cash flow. But you got the experience in the, in the positive cash flow versus if this is your teeth property, you're both comfortable taking more risk, meaning more risk will reward, which means a greater cash flow. Mm -hmm. So for newer investors, I would say is don't expect to retire off of the first property, right? It's more important to get the experience and, and seeing the positive results. Even if it's as low as say, say they do a, a turnkey purchase for renter inside and they don't do a rehab, right? Mm -hmm. It's very low risk and the cash flow is just a hundred dollars a month. Just the act of taking action to do that process to start their journey. And then over time, they may increase the, re the return that they're looking for, for as far as a property. No, that's a good word. Sometimes it's hard to convince people of that because they have in dreams they'll buy one duplex and they, you know, they can retire. It's like, well, it's not really like that. <laughs> oh, you know, got to get started. And, and so some people are concerned I'm doing all this effort and, you know, it's just a hundred dollars a month. Does that make sense? So that, that's interesting to hear your perspective. So I do want to add, you know, based on what you just said is that what the, 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 the newer investor or even like a, a newer investor, as you remember, you know, as you grow and scale and get more properties, the $100 might be $200. And then over time, it all adds up and it starts to snowball. So, yes, the first property might not be that, you know, $2,000 with the first property. But if you start to accumulate and manage it well and, you know, over time, it will, it will snowball as you add them all together. Okay. Hmm. Uh, another question people ask me, um, is it a good idea to, say, tap into home equity for either investment property or primary home to fund a down payment? Because we t I talked about, you know, maybe you got less money out when that last spur. So you're looking at where else can I pull the equity out? And this this could be for down payment or also repairs. You know, we were talking about a lot of people... Um, Part of the risk of managing bigger projects is you may need more capital for doing repairs, and maybe another property is a, a, a source for that. Like, so what would you? What kind of guidance would you give about people who are thinking about pulling equity from another property for a new investment? So I guess with the the down payment piece, whether it be a home equity line of credit or equity from another property, I would say, depending on the path you take, there'll be different. I guess, debt structures, right? And then there's also different risks. So people also might even do credit cards. So I would say, you know, whether it's a home equity line of credit or it's a credit card or another property, just understand the risk you're taking and then factor in that new debt into your overall numbers. That way, you make the as you deploy that capital into a new you know, investment property, the numbers should include that initial debt to say, okay, this is the cash flow and there's still cash flow when I factor in the payment for that line of credit or the payment that I have to make for the um, equity that I pulled out from another property. So, you know, once again, just include that number. Let's not be naive about it. Uh, include those numbers. If you are purchasing a property that needs rehab, you can get the loan that includes the re repair money as part of the initial loan to purchase a property. If you also own the property already, you can also, there are also loan products available to where you can tap into the current equity and give rehab funds to repair a property. Right. And then just when you're saying understand the risk means that that money that you're pulling from another source still has to make sense in the overall return on the investment. So you can't like exclude it. So if you, you know, you throw in, let's say $20,000 of more capital and that like kills the ROI, the deal, it's not a good deal if, um, you have to do that. If you're not getting the income on the other side, it doesn't make sense to, to leverage your, your home in that way. That's where you're going. Yeah. So for example, if somebody does like a traditional cash refinance, they're going to have a, a monthly payment and have the money in their hand, right? Independent of them finding a new property yet. Versus did a, a line of credit, for example, it sounds like a big credit card. They have the money available they aren't making any payments yet until they deploy that capital. So literally understanding the, the, the mechanism of how you're using that money. 
And also to the line of credit, it might be a variable rate that changes, but you're not paying anything until you use that money. So yeah, so you know, it doesn't hurt to have multiple options to how, it, how to purchase a property. Okay. Now, you if can, you, um, I mean, I guess it's a tough question because you're, you're saying something that maybe some lenders may have not even broached with their clients. It's like, do you have the money? All right, cool. We're closed. You know, like, so how much do you coach? You put your other hat on your clients around that 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 risk because technically you can make money off doing the loan, but then they lose money, you know, a year from now, and then they're mad at you because you know they're in a bad deal over their head. So do you the what the what kind of coaching do you give people on the front end about this kind of understanding the risk? Yeah. So whenever there's a say a loan product. If it's about rehab loan, it's a, a riskier loan product, but it's designed for you to have the funds to create equity in the property, right? Mm -hmm. And when it and so so they will the, the and they also know too rehab loans, the term the max term might be two years, right? Mm -hmm. So there's risk as far as getting the project done in a short amount of time and paying it off, and then you know the client will know what the estimated funds are needed before they even submit their offer. But for that way, they, they can evaluate the available capital. Or also, too, most of the time I tell investors, like, hey, if the, you know, they're trying to they need additional funds, they have to, you know, change the question. You know, how do I get enough capital to purchase this, pro this property, right? And it might not it might not be their own money. They may bring in mm -hmm. business partners. So just thinking differently, like, you know, I need funds. It doesn't really have to come from me. I may have a good deal on paper where the numbers are awesome and, I can tell you a lot of people want to invest in real estate. So if they reach out to the network, they may be surprised. They may find the funds available from like a relative or a coworker who have the same mindset that they want to invest in real estate and build generational wealth. Yeah, that's a good point. That's probably a whole nother topic. But that I, I think for some people, adding in a partner or two may make, may make um, perfect sense. In terms of is there still kind of like hard and soft money? You know, we call it rehab loans, but some people may just think of that as like hard money. And then I've heard some people call it, oh, my loan is soft. So, <laughs> so I, I'll break it down into two formats. Short-term money is typically money needed for rehab. And you may hear the terms hard money, private money, bridge loans. At the end of the day, it's short-term money for rehab that needs to be paid back within, say, less than two years. And then you have... I call it more st uh, standard uh, for, for properties that are moving ready or turnkey, like a traditional, say, 30 year fixed option or 7 1 arm, where it's, you know, amortized over 30 years and it's more what you're kind of used to as far as the terms. So, short term money for rehabs and long term money when the property is um, functional and moving ready. Okay, and there's one other loan product that I wanted you to touch on, the DSCR loan, as far as con contrast with conventional loans. A lot of my clients that get started with a uh, conventional loan um, in their name, and they put 20% down for a single family. But now there's, it seems like it's more popular for investors who are using these DSCR loans. Could you speak a little bit about that loan product? Yeah, as I mentioned, the long-term money, that's more the DSCR loan. Okay. And, and and the reason why, when you do commercial mortgage lending, you know, for investors, we don't need your personal income, right? We're going to assess each property individually. So, for example, if they want to do a DSCR loan, a debt service coverage loan, we're going to ask what's the property address, what's your purchase price, what are the current estimated rents, what are the taxes, what are the insurance and we'll use those numbers to help qualify you for the loan, independent of your personal income. So, you know, we're not worried about your DTI and any of your previous purchases. So from that perspective, it's hyper-focused on that particular property and the numbers to that property to determine the loan structure. So from that perspective, and also, like I said, it's also going to be like a 30-year fixed, right? So very similar to a conventional loan, but without the different uh, caveats of looking at your income. Hmm. Now, the so drawback it is it's a little higher rate, though, just to throw, throw that out there. Well, I don't know per se if it's a higher rate because mm. it, it might be competitive or might be even slightly lower than potentially a, a conventional loan. But, you know, I'm not pricing the conventional loans out side by side to, to tell you one way or the other. But 
I, I don't necessarily say that the rates will be high. The rates will be higher for say rehab loans, short mm -hmm. shorter term loans, but for the okay. DSE or thirty year fix, it might be competitive or it might be even lower sometimes. Okay. And I, and I, mean, I, I guess say that, it's like you look the holistically. I guess you're saying the cost versus just like the pure rate per because usually the rate is like by credit score, right? For both of those products. So, so when it comes to DSCR, you have your experience, you have the credit score, and the amount of leverage you're taking to on the loan, right? Are you doing twenty percent down versus forty percent down? So all that plays a factor. And I can say, the reason why I say. Mm -hmm. It might not necessarily be low because I've, I've had clients who went to a traditional bank, tried to do a conventional loan and then switched to me, you know, because, they, you know, after the fact and my mm -hmm. rate came in lower than the, the rate quoted from the bank. And, and for that particular client, the credit score was great. They did a larger down payment. And so it's not going to be it's not going to be always the case where conventional loans be better than a DSCR loan because there's all the other factors that, that play a part into the equation. Okay, no, that's that's a good point. I learned something there. So just before we wrap up, I did want to touch on because obviously, you know, because of your experience, you're able to allow, give a lot of value to your clients. And I just wonder if there's something that you wish more of your clients told you up front so that you could really help them scale. Uh, what are some things that they you wish they would have told you up front, but they just didn't know? My initial conversation with any client, if they, if they don't tell me I'm going to ask a certain question, I'm going to say, what's your strategy for this particular property? What type of investment do you want to do? And then why do you want to do it? Mm -hmm. And so I typically ask those questions anyway, um, just to get an idea. Like they purchased the property one to three Main Street, for example, right? And, you know, I'll ask them, you know, yes, you are doing uh, a, a, the bird strategy. We're going to rehab it and keep it as a rental. I'll also ask them, how long do you plan to keep them as a rental? Because that way, when we put, put that long-term debt, we put the right type of long-term debt on the property. So I, I, let me give you an example. I had a client that was doing a long-term DSER loan, and they plan to sell the property within within two years. That's their, or maybe three years, from two or three years, right? So from that scenario, knowing their strategy, instead of a traditional 30-year fixed DSER loan, we did a 30 year interest only loan, which increased their cash flow. And then because they planned on selling it, you know, within five years, it worked for their particular strategy. So mm -hmm. I do ask my clients, what are their strategy for a particular piece of property or their portfolio so that we have the right loan structures to match their strategy? Right. Now, and, and I can say I've witnessed it because we I had a consultation with you. And you did ask that question, but I could re recall, you know, meeting with other clients and then, you know, here's the pre-approval or, you know, here's the term sheet. And I asked them, did you tell, ask the lender that, you know, putting in, you know, this much of rehab? Like, oh no, I didn't tell them about that. I just said, I need a piece of paper that said, you know, I could borrow $300,000. I'm like, yeah, I think you need to call him back and tell him what you're trying to do. So that's why I wanted to kind of make that point of, because I think sometimes people feel like I'm going to tell the lender, especially a new relationship, what they need to know to get this deal right in front of them done, but they miss out on the opportunity to kind of build a relationship where they can actually grow if they just had a broader conversation with people like you. Yep, I agree. So, so Owen, I appreciate your time. Is there any last, I guess, pieces of wisdom that you would give to newer investor who really wants to scale and not kind of get stuck, you know, not feeling like they are not able to continue to fund the deals that they see in front of them? So I guess a, a couple of things, um, make, make, you know, be ready to, to solve the problem, right? So if the problem is funding, say, how do I get more funding? Just make sure we, we, we have the right mindset of how we are asking ourselves questions. Because you say, I don't have the money, you just stop, right? <laughs> but that's the reality, right? Right, if you say, that's why I hear it. Yeah. You, know, you know, I get the money, just that mm -hmm. quick change keeps you thinking about how do I solve the problem? Mm -hmm. So I would tell the best, you know, ask yourself, how do I get better? Ask the questions and be ready to solve the problem. I'm also, you know, say to investors, you know, you know my quote is, uh, fear plus action equals growth, right? It's a new process. Embrace the fear. 
take mm-hmm. the action and over time the fear will drop down and then the growth will start to happen. Okay. So do you think rates are going to drop further this year? Th- that's what the Your um, prediction. My, my prediction is that <laughs> well, I'm going to say a disclaimer. You know, I'm not a, I'm like, all my disclaimers, I'm not an attorney or accountant or I can't predict the future. However, I do anticipate in the, in the future that there's a, a strong chance of rates dropping, not a, probably not a big drop, but at least a slight drop. But of course, you know, they're always reviving the data. I would say, I don't think the rates are going to go. I think that worst case scenario, I think they're going to stay steady. And then over time, they may dip. So from that perspective, I, I think for now, we might be at the potential peak of where the rates are as far as, uh, so if the, if the current numbers work, you know, the, the guidance I'll say, okay, it's going to stay the same or go down. That's my prediction. Oh, all right. On that note, thanks, Owen, for your time. Before I wrap up, I do want to touch on the point about what is a good cash flow for a rental property. Now, general principle is you don't want to go into a situation where you're going to be losing money month over month or even worse yet, year over year. Now, we did say the appropriate number really depends on your investment strategy, your experience, and your risk profile. So there really isn't one universal number. Now, you will find that there, you'll hear you know, on these YouTube and podcast streets, people may push the envelope with that. And they're generally more experienced investors. So just take it all with a grain of salt. Now, if you want to hear more about thoughts about how you should think about cash flow, you'll want to check out the video that's appearing on the screen now. And as always, thanks for watching. Happy investing.